everybody. Good to see you all tonight, and welcome. I'm glad that you are here for midweek. I uh, got a lot of announcements rolling, a lot of things that are happening, and uh, man, you know, a lot of, a lot of things upcoming, and you're going to see that in your Worship Guide Sunday. We've laid out some big events for March, February, March, April, a lot of things that are happening, so I won't, uh, I won't spoil it, but I did preview it today, so... Um, putting a lot of things together on our, on our, for our church emphasis and uh, continuing to do that. And the Lord is good in that respect and helping us, uh, leading us and empowering us and helping us put all of those things together. So, hey, join me tonight back in the book of 1 Thessalonians, this time chapter 2. We finished chapter 1, so this time chapter 2. And so as we look at chapter 2, we're not going to look at the entire chapter, but only the first 12 verses. So I did want us to look at the witness of the church in the world. So in thinking about this, I I wanted to, to, to guess, introduce that as, as important as it is for our witness. We are the church. Uh, and so to say, hey, well, if you got you have your own personal witness, true, but also you comprise the church. The church is made up of the people, not necessarily the steeple. So you are the church. So as you go and I go, we carry the witness of Christ with us. So well, I want us to consider. What kind of witness do we, the church, give into the community around us? And so it's the lives of people, uh, and we make an impression on people. And so the church has a witness in the community. So I want us to look at what the church of Thessalonica, what kind of witness they had to their community, and then extract some of those precepts from that and then look at where we are and how what kind of witness we have in our community so let's go to the lord in prayer before we look and uh, see what god will lead us to tonight father we love you and we thank you and again i thank you for the ministries across our facilities tonight lord with students with children with our choir Father, the different areas and, and groups who are meeting and, and participating and working, Father, to, to better understand your word and apply your word, Father, in their lives and for those who are preparing to lead us in worship on Sunday. And so, Father, I pray that your grace will abound over all of these as we meet tonight. In Christ's name I pray, amen. All right, well, let me get you to look with me in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. So as Paul begins this letter, now he's reminding the readers at this particular church at this particular time about those three weeks they were together. Again, we have to confer and go back to Acts chapter 17. We see when Paul, uh, Silas, and Timothy were in Thessalonica for only a 21-day or so period of time. He says, For you yourselves know, brethren, that our coming to you was not in vain. But after we had already suffered and had been mistreated in Philippi, as you know, we had the boldness in our God to speak to you the gospel of God amid such much opposition. For our exhortation does not come from error or impurity or by way of deceit. But just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak. Not as pleasing men, but God who examines our heart. For we never came with flattering speech, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed. God is witness. Nor did we seek glory from men, either from you or from others, or even though as apostles of Christ we may have asserted our authority, but we prove to be gentle among you as a nursing mother tenderly cares for her own children. Having so fond an affection for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also on our own lives because you had become very dear to us. 
For you recall, brethren, our labor and hardship, how working night and day so as not to be a burden to any of you, we proclaim to you the gospel of God. You are witnesses, and so is God, how devoutly and uprightly and blamelessly we behave towards you believers. Just as you know, just as you know how we were exhorting and encouraging and imploring each of you who as a father would his own children, so that you would walk in a manner worthy of the God who calls you in to his own kingdom. So in these 12 verses, Paul is talking about what their witness is into their community and how he and Paul and Silas and Timothy, what their witness was to these now believers in Thessalonica, but then what those Thessalonians, Thessalonians, what their witness is into their context. So we begin with this. There has to be a boldness in sharing the gospel. And Paul talked about that in verses 1 and 2. Paul summarized the mission effort at Philippi. He, he talks, he's writing to Thessalonica, but he's talking about when he was in Philippi in verse 2. But you've already suffered and have been mistreated in Philippi. So he's saying, look, we've been through this stuff before. We were preaching the gospel, teaching the gospel, and we were treated cruelly. We were beaten and placed in stocks in the prison. But rather than sing the jailhouse blues in prison, as we found in Acts 16 in Philippi, they began to sing praises to the Lord. So here's something that Paul is teaching us. Now, he, rather than analyze, hey, what went wrong? What could we have done better so that people wouldn't have gotten mad or wouldn't have gotten upset at the gospel? What could we have done? How could we have soft-pedaled the gospel so that people wouldn't get upset and wouldn't get mad? But he wouldn't do that. He was going to preach the unadulterated gospel of Jesus Christ no matter what was done. Some time ago, many, many studies have been done, uh, you know, the different polls and different uh, aspects to try to determine, hey, how does the church meet a, a changing world? And so, you know, people have come landed all over the place on this topic. Well, the church has got to do this. The church has got to do that. The church has got to do this. And so some people comment and they say, well, the church must change to fit society better. But that's not the truth. We must never, ever compromise the gospel. We can never sell the gospel short. We can never pollute the gospel. We can never bring in ideas or casual Christianity. It's not going to be this Sunday night, because this Sunday night we're going to look at, at Matthew chapter 7, 1 through 12. But then the next Sunday night in Winter Bible Study, we're going to look at 13 through the end of the, the chapter, which I've been laying out this week. I usually work at least two weeks ahead, and so I'm kind of finalizing that. But we'll see in chapter 7, verse 21 and 22, where Jesus, as he's concluding the Sermon on the Mount, says this, And that day many will call on my name, and I will tell them, I never knew you. I didn't know who you were. They know about Jesus, but they weren't in a relationship with Jesus. Because casual Christianity had taken over. And that's what happens if there's not a boldness in the presentation of the true gospel. We can adapt uh, to our world, but we've got to keep the gospel pure. We've got to keep it pure. We can't adulterate that. We adapt things to our world. We have electricity in our church. Have we adapted? Yeah. We didn't say we are the church where we're going to light a candle. Electricity came. We put electricity in the churches. We've adapted, but it didn't change the message. We adapt with buildings and different things that we do. We adapt, we do things, but it doesn't change the message. And so Paul was talking about that, not compromising the gospel. We adapt, but we don't change. A church that changes her witness to tolerance loses their credibility every single time. And so we've got to be an authentic witness. You know, I don't know a lot about the generations behind me, but I re try to read about them. 
And I try to figure out, you know, I don't understand all the sociological terms. When you, when you get past baby boomers, I kind of get lost. But then there's Generation X, Y, and Lisa's a teacher, and the, you're teaching all of these generations. And, and we were talking the other day, James, about, you know, something about the new tech, not new terminology if something was bussing or something. I don't even know what that means. If you're bussing, I just assume that's a big yellow school bus that's going <laughs> to come by and pick you up. And we're going to bus you over across town. You know, I don't understand all of that, but this is what I, I do know. I am learning about the next generation. You know what they respond to more than anything else? Genuine you. Be you. Don't be fake. They don't care. They don't care if you're a hippie or you're square. They don't care if you wear wingtips or you wear boots. They don't care if you wear flip-flops. You be you. You just be genuine and who you are. That's who, that's what matters to them. They don't care. You know, in some other generations, you had to conform to be somebody or some this role or that role or that role or this role or you had to fake this or fake that these are generations they just want something that's genuinely authentic it doesn't matter if you if they really resonate with who you are just are you true they want to know the truth because they live in a world that is always pulling at them, selling at them, prying them, telling them, encouraging them, selling and marketing something to them. And they want to know, is this true? Is it genuine? Can I really believe in what you're saying is true? Or is it another ploy? Is it another strategy? Is it another trick? Is it another scam? Is it another hoax? Or is it really true? That's what they're searching for. So to really be an effective witness in this culture and this generation, we've got to be the real deal. We've got to really be who we say we are. And Paul referenced that so many times, and I'm going to mention it again. And, and, and in, in, in verse 10, he says, you are witnesses and so is God, how we were devout and upright and blamelessly behaving towards you. He's saying, we didn't come to you with pretense. We didn't come to you with false information. We didn't come to you and portray we were something that we're not. We just came to you as real people living a real life with being an authentic witness. Not only is it an authentic witness, but it's also a courageous witness. You know, Paul was very courageous and bold in his witnessing, but also Paul was also very honest in his letters. And some of the letters that he would write, he would say, and pray for me that I may speak with boldness as I ought to and not cower down. He had that struggle too. You know, we look, might look and say, well, you know, second to Jesus, he is the greatest theologian of the New Testament. But he always had that tension. I don't know, man, when I say it, they all going to get mad. And he always had that tension of backing down and not really being a bold witness. And so he was asking for believers to pray for him that he would boldly speak. There was Joshua in the Old Testament. You know, I was reading about this. Could you imagine when God, when Moses said, hey, Joshua, come here. You know, you've been like the second in command all these years, and you've done a really great job, but God's, gonna, God's already told me that uh, I'm not going to cross the river, and I'm not going to make it, and God's not going to let me be the leader in the new land. And so you're going to be the new leader in the, good la in the new land, so good luck and be of good courage and carry on. And then all of a sudden, Joshua's been not the guy. So whenever everything's going crazy and going wrong, he's always, hey, Moses, we got a problem. Basically, he's saying, hey, Moses, you got a problem. And now Joshua's got to be the one. He's got the problem. It's his problem. He's the leader. And so he had to take that next role and that step. Joshua 1 9 when Moses was talking to him he said hey be strong and courageous the Lord your God is with you wherever you go 
but only be strong and courageous, for continuing to repeat that theme all in his life and pouring that into him. I think of other people, too. I, I think of a, of a guy named, uh, a lesser-known prophet, if you will. It's Micaiah. And, and I'm going to come to 1 Kings for a, just a second. In 1 Kings chapter 22, and uh, this, this sort of, a, I must say, lesser-known story, but I guess it sort of is. But it, I'm just going to kind of spot read, but I'm going to get to the, to the main part here in just a minute. But it says, Three years passed without war between Aram and Israel. In the third year of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, came down from the king, down to king of Israel. Now the king of Israel said to his servants, Do you not know that Ramah, Gilead, belongs to us, and we're still doing nothing to take it out of the king of Aram? And he said to Jehoshaphat, Will you go with me to battle against Ramoth, Gilead? And Jehoshaphat said to the king of Israel, I am as you are. My people are as your people. My horses are your horses. Meaning, yes, I'm throwing my lot in with you. It's a fancy way of saying, yeah, sure. So, and so, and he says in verse 7, but Jehoshaphat says, Is that not yet a prophet of the Lord here that we may inquire of him? And then the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, Is there yet one man by whom we may inquire of the Lord? But I hate him because he does not prophesy good about me, but evil. <laughs> There's a guy. He's a prophet of God, but I hate him. <laughs> All right. Don't tell me how you really feel. He is Micaiah, son of Imlah. But Jehoshaphat said, let not the king say so. And then the king of Israel called an officer and said, bring quickly Micaiah, son of Imlah. Now the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, were sitting each on his throne, arrayed in their robes, in the threshing floor, the entrance to the gate of Samaria, and all the prophets were prophesying before them. Then Zedekiah, the son of Chaniah, uh, Chenina made horns of iron and said to them, Thus says the Lord, Will you, with these you will gore the Aramean, Arameans until they are consumed. And all the prophets were prophesying, saying, Go on in to Ramoth Gilead and prosper, for the Lord will give it to the hand, king, hands of the king. And then the messenger who went to summon Micaiah spoke to him, saying, Behold, now the words of the prophets are uniformly favorable to the king. He's getting coached up. That's what's happening. The guy's gone to get him. He's like, look, they want you. Now, all the other prophets they've got, they're in there telling, oh, king, you're the best, you're the best, you're the best in the north, south, east, and west. You're the best, you're the best. You're going to win everything. You're going to do everything. So I'm just letting you know, all the other guys are getting in line with this thing, and they're telling the kings how good they are and how they're going to win. So I'm just giving you like a heads up. Give them a little, give them a little pep talk that it's all going to be okay. Here goes your boy Micaiah. When he came to the king, the king said to him, Micaiah, shall we go to Ramoth Gilead to battle, or shall we refrain? And he answered, Go up and succeed, and the Lord will give it into the hand of their king. <laughs> and the king said to him, How many times must I adjure you to speak to me nothing but the truth in the name of the Lord? So he said, I can't do anything. I've got to tell you what God says, not what you want to hear. But a lot of times we do that. We want to surround ourselves with people who tell us what? Just what I want to hear. I'm not really, one person put it this way, I really don't want to hear your opinion. I want to hear my opinion coming out of your mouth. <laughs> That's what I want to hear. I want to hear me coming out of you. And that's what they were wanting so they could say, hey, you know what, all the prophets are saying this. And Micaiah's like, I can't tell you something other than what God tells me to tell you. I can't tell you anything but the truth of the word of the Lord. And so that really is, it takes a boldness in presenting the gospel, of not watering down the gospel, but keeping the gospel pure and intact and giving it the truth to this world. So which brings us to the second point. We saw in verses 3 and 6 of 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 to be a truthful witness. Vance Havner said, It is not our business to make the message acceptable. It is our message, me, me, mission rather, to make the message available. We are not to make see that people like it. 
we are to see that people get it. You can't make people like it, but you can be sure they get it. You can put it out there. And I think that's what Micaiah was doing. He's like, hey, you're not going to like it. But the word of the Lord is the word of the Lord. And being truthful with that. And how do how to we lead people to the Lord by their lifestyle. These verses reveal in 3 through 6 the mind of Paul in presenting the gospel. Paul was like, there's no gimmicks, there's no tricks, there's nothing. Constantly bearing in mind your work of faith and labor and steadfastness of hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. We already saw that. For our exhortation does not come from error or impurity or by way of deceit. But just as we've been approved by God, we've been entrusted with the gospel. So we speak not as to please men, but to please God who examines our hearts. We never came with flattering speech or with pretext or greed. God is a witness to these things. And that's what Paul was writing. There's no gimmicks. There's no tricks. There's no hidden agenda. Here's the fact. I'm not responsible for what other churches do or don't do. It's not my game. But if you use gimmicks to get them, you'll have to use gimmicks to keep them. And what do you have? If you use the gospel to get them, it is the gospel that will keep them. That's what keeps them. It's the gospel, not the gimmick. Years ago, decades ago, one of my childhood friends, we grew up together, and, and we joke, it was our first suspension. We were suspended together in the fifth grade. <laughs> we were best friends, best friends. Best friend, his name's Barry. And one day at the water fountain, you know, we were fifth grade boys, so you're always, I don't know what the deal is with the fifth grade. You're always tussling, you know. You just, you know, I wanted water, he wanted water. Well, you know, there was no, you just don't get water at the same time, so you, you got to throw some elbows or whatever. I don't know what it was. He threw one a little too harder than I appreciated, or I threw one who, and anyway, a tussle turned, my, my best friend. It's on. It's on. Pull out, roll around on the floor, kicking, scratching, gouging, pinching, biting the whole nine. And I remember Mr. Hogan, our teacher, our science teacher, had us sit. I remember him. I, I was scared of him, too. I wasn't scared of Barry, but I was scared of him. And he was like, boys, y'all are supposed to be best friends. And I was like, we are. And I was like, hold my lip, you know, because he done <laughs> jacked me up pretty good. And his lies black. You know. So three-day suspension. So we grew up. We, we met again in junior high and high school. Went to, you know, we still talk about it. Remember that first time we were ever suspended? And that probably tells you a lot when you say the first time we were ever suspended. <laughs> but we're not going there. So, uh, but Barry, we ended up going in the ministry. And he was in the, in the North Mississippi region. And he was serving as a student pastor. And they had a new pastor. And Barry had a, had a good sized youth group. And the new minister told him, he said, Barry, I'm going to give you three months. I want 125 kids on Wednesday night. If you don't get 125 kids here on Wednesday night. He's like, how am I going to get 100? I can't make this up. I don't care what you do. Do giveaways, do gimmicks, do win an iPod, you know, whatever. Whatever it takes, you get them here. And then he called me and said, now, I can't. I'm not about the gimmick. I'm about the gospel. I would rather have 25 students who want to grow, know, and grow in the Lord. And let them reach others. Than it to be all superficial and no depth. And so what are you going to do? Sort of like a Micaiah moment. He said, I'm going to do what God tells me to do. Three months later. Wasn't working out. Barry told me. He said, yep, I was cleaning up there. He said, you know, he already told me that. He said, I went up there on a Saturday. I was just going to start packing some stuff up. 
He said the new guy was already moving stuff in. You did what you got to do. Because it wasn't about gimmicks. It wasn't about tricks. It's not about all these ploys. It was about the gospel. And Jesus modeled this for us. Jesus had the masses. We've already looked at this on the Sermon on the Mount. He had the, the huge crowd, but he took 12. Start it small. Do it right. Grow it fast. 12 turned into 120, which turned into a few hundred, which turned into a few thousand, which began to multiply itself out. And so being a truthful witness of how we lead and how we, 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 we share the, the love of the Lord with a lifestyle is something that, that's very real and very, very plausible in our lives because Paul is writing not of deceit, not as pleasing men, not of flattery, but of telling the absolute truth. And this was the, the model that was taken by Jesus. Jesus never sought to deceive people about the nature of his teaching. He wanted people to know that it was not an easy life. I mean, Jesus said, hey, sit down and count the cost of what you're getting into. Did he not? Did he not say, take up your cross and follow me? Nobody wants a cross. Jesus would tell us foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. In the Sermon on the Mount, in the latter part that we hadn't gotten to on Sunday morning yet, blessed are you when they revile you and persecute you for my name's sake. He told them all this on the front end. When you're opening up your greatest sermon on the mount, and you're right there, hey, let's tell you something. If you're going to follow me, there's going to come a day that people are going to persecute you. When they're going to revile you, when they're not going to like you and like what comes out of your mouth about me. He told us that on the front end. And as the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, we've got to evangelize the world, and we've got to be straightforward and truthful with that too. We've got to come back and, and be real to our mission. And our mission, I, I, I like the three E's of our mission, is to exalt the Savior. We're, we're gathered for worship, for corporate worship. We exalt the Savior. We're here to equip, this, to evangelize the lost, to share the gospel, and to equip the saints. So we exalt the Savior in praise and worship, and that's what we're gathered about, to worship the Lord. But we're also here to evangelize the lost, to share the message of the gospel into this community. And when people are saved, we are here to equip the saved, to equip them, to grow them, to disciple them. And so there's no cheap grace and there's no easy commitment. And we can't tickle their ears. As a matter of fact, we're actually warned about that in 2 Timothy chapter 4 when Paul's last letter ever penned in the Bible, that's what we think ever that we have in the Word of God. This is the last one. He said this, I, I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season, rebuke, reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. For the time will come where they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires and will turn away their ears from the truth and turn aside to myths. But you be sober or vigilant in all things, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, Fulfill your ministry. Those are huge, huge words. Fulfill your ministry. And then third, we've got to show compassion and love to the lost. In our text tonight, in verses 7 and 8, but we prove to be gentle among you as a nursing mother tenderly cares for her own children. 
having so a fond an affection for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel, but also our own lives, because you had become very dear to us. For you recall our labor and hardship, how working day and night. And so gentle among you, affectionately desiring of you, you were dear to us. And so this text reminds me that the church's mission, this church's mission, is to evangelize, not antagonize. Why are we going to be antagonistic? Evangelize, not antagonize. We've got to learn from Christ and we've got to learn from this Apostle Paul that we can be straightforward, we can be confrontational when we need to be. We can be insistent on repentance. And all of this can be done with compassion. With compassion. Still loving people. Still loving people. Charles Haddon Spurgeon was a preacher of another century at another time. People have asked him. This is a story that a group of preachers were around him and said, basically ask him how in the world could he preach and have such a great love for, I mean, preach for, to the loss in the way that he did, and people would respond to the gospel message when he would preach. And they said he was standing at a window when he, was, when he heard that question. And people were standing there, and he, to see his response, he gazed out the window of all the people walking up and down the city sidewalks and streets, and they said he began to weep. because I weep over them. Jesus weeps over you. Spurgeon even said, you'll never be a soul winner, a winner of souls until you're first a weeper of souls. You'll never win people until you weep over them. Until you really care for their lost condition. Think about Jesus and the woman at the well. He confronted her, yet he never berated her, nor did he antagonize her. He confronted her. She had to come face to face, but he had still had love and compassion on her. And that's what she responded to. In Romans chapter 5, Romans chapter 5, if you, if you just need some bedtime reading about sin and the love of God and how sin separates and how God regenerates, go to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, just two verses. The law came in so that the transgression would increase, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. Here's the deal. I am a great sinner in need of a great Savior. That's it. There is no sin that is too great. Because the Bible even says it right here. Where sin increased, where it was a really high level, where I am a really, really, really good sinner. God is a really, really, really great God. And my sin can never be greater than His grace to me. That's, you know, that's for we people who say, but you don't know. I don't know. I don't need to know. God knows. And God tells me that where your sin is great, His grace is greater. Always, always, it's always better. It's always enough. He is enough to cover all of that. So as sin reigned in death, verse 21, even so grace would reign through righteousness, through eternal life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. The Lord knew that woman's life. He knew her pattern. He knew her situation. And he met her there. He knew. Hey, she's coming today about noon. 
why don't the rest of you guys toddle on into town, grab a bite? I got an appointment right here. There's a lady I need to talk to. I need to talk to her, and she needs to fire me today. Let life, the last thing, live life with an eye toward eternity. And so as we look at these last two verses that I selected for us to look at tonight in 1 Thessalonians, <coughs> we, we look and we see in verses 10, 11, and 12 that there was nothing in the life of Paul or his constituents that we, he did not want to cast a bad light on the Christian faith. He wanted to live above board. Paul knew how important it was for him to live what he preached. And so in that 12th verse, in the last portion of the 12th verse, he's telling us there that in whose kingdom that is to come. So we live with an eye toward eternity. We're here. We're here right now. But we also know that we're already if we're in Christ, we're already born into that kingdom, and we're living here. Our feet are here. Our life is planted here. Our breath is here. We're going to be here, but we also have a, a, an eye cut over, so to speak, toward eternity, for we know that is our home. And so we're to live a life that reflects a, a good life of God and his church. You know, I want us to think about something. <clears throat> I wanted to ask you to, to think with me about uh, a couple of questions. And that is, I wanted to think about, are we motivated by desire to please God or are we motivated by a desire to please people? That was what verse 4 said. He said, hey, for chapter 2, verse 4, he said, hey, we weren't people pleasers, we wanted to be God pleasers. And so... You know, there's always that tension. And so as a church, you know, we've got to realize what is our focus and what's our main topic and where, where do we, who are we really trying to please? And I really, to throw that question out is to, to really think about another aspect of that, which is found in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 13. After the roll call of faith, but Enoch, but Abel, but Enoch, and all of Abraham, and all these others, and Sarah, and all these others, he says this, And all these died in faith, without receiving the promise, but having seen them, and having welcomed them from a distance, and having confessed that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For those who say such things make it clear that they are seeking a country of their own. And indeed, if they had been thinking of that country from which they went out, they would have had an opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, and he has prepared a city for them. So what are we really thinking about? Who do we really want to please when we think about our witness, when we think about maybe being uncomfortable sharing Christ. When we think about what are they going to think, what are they going to do? Come back to Havner's statement. It's, it's, not, it, it, it's not our business if they accept it. It's our business to make it available for them to hear. But that's what it's about. So are we God pleasers or are we trying to be men pleasers? Here's a question I wanted to ask you to think about and, and answer if you want. Why do many people view Christians as phony or fake? Anybody? Y'all, I mean, I know y'all heard that. Because we don't talk to phony Christians. It happens a lot of times. And Paul was making a case because he was like, listen, for those times we were with you, we, in verse 10, we tried to do absolutely everything the way God would want us to do it. We tried not to seek ourselves, serve ourselves. You know, but people say, yeah, you know, they're phony, they're fake, they're hypocrites. We have people saying that. We don't practice what we preach anymore. 
I don't know how it popped up, but somehow this uh, comedian, I'm not going to say that he's a Christian comedian, but uh, he is a comedian. And by the way that he talked, it sounded like he's a Christian because he was playing a little bit, play, you know, in harmlessly playing about how church people, we church, he, 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 self-inclusive, we church people are a strange bunch. And he talked about some of our things that we say and things that we do. It was kind of funny because we all recognize it if you've been in, in, in the faith and in church for some time. But, but he, he went on to say, he said, but I did learn something. I learned that there might be full-time Christians and part-time Christians. He said, and, and I called a lady on a day off that she wasn't working. <laughs> he said, I was calling her. And he said, and she lit into me, you know, who, how'd you get this number? He said, she used a lot of coarse language. <laughs> he said, and then I finally said, well, this is, um, you know, brother so-and-so from the church. <laughs> and uh, let's see, he's, uh, he said, and you have to say it church with an emphasis like it's spiritually, you know, like the church. <laughs> and so then she knew. She said, oh, brother, bless you, my, bless you, brother, and said the whole countenance, the whole conversation changed. He said, and this was his punchline. He said, and this was my fault, because I didn't realize she was part-time, and I caught her on a day off. <laughs> and, and, you know, and I was thinking about it, and I thought, you know, it, it was funny when I watched it, but I thought, you know, really? There's no such thing as a day off. <laughs> when you go to the cleaners and you can't find your coat, when you when you when you get your shirt and it's not right and you first go hey you lose it, you lose it or it's not right or it's tore up or something happens and you you get in your car service and something happened and you go Whoa. no part time they're still watching how you respond to that Still watching. Did you act like every other body? That it didn't work out just in your favor, so you had a little fit? Did you take a moment of what is frustrating, but still realize I am who I am in Christ, and I, we're going to find a way to work through this redemptively? Find a way to, you know, make this work so that there's not a taint on the witness of my self, but more importantly, on the Lord's church and on the Lord himself. To where somebody can't say, well, you know, well, you know she's, a, she's, she's fine, so you get her out of sight of church. <laughs> Fuck Alabama. <laughs> what? Fuck up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, or, you know, the old joke, you know, if you're going to take a Baptist fishing, you always take two. One of them will drink all your beer if you don't. So <laughs> heard that one all my life. If you're going to take a Baptist fishing, take two. Be sure you take two. Somebody to tell on them. So, you know, it is. <laughs> y'all are shocked back there at the back table. Sorry. But yeah, I mean, I've heard that joke all my life. You know? I went on a fishing trip one time. I think I was the only, you know, and so, you know, it was on this fishing trip. A lot of people were partaking. I'll say that. But I wasn't. And they were like, man, you know something? I was like, look, man, you got to do you. And, uh, you know, I'm just going to tell you, I'm the one cat on this boat. You don't have to worry about getting in your cooler when your back's turned. So, uh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but it was a witnessing opportunity. you evangelize you don't antagonize and as a result what God did not what I did spiritual conversations emerge and as a result three of those individuals have been baptized in the course of the last ten years and we have evangelized judgment-free, right? Grace calls. Judgment-free. We 
going to learn that this Sunday night. Judgment is free, and it is so easy to get. But grace costs our Savior his life. Grace costs him. It's going to cost you something, too, to get there. It's going to hurt a little bit inside. But it pales in comparison to what it costs him. That's loneliness. It's a great, great church in a turbulent world in a turbulent time. And I think we can learn from it. So let's pray together. Father, we love you and I thank you for the message of being an authentic believer that is not caving in or cowering away from the true message of the gospel that transforms and that saves and that puts a new path in life. Father, help us to model our lives after Jesus who laid out the truth coupled with love. May we be, have a powerful, powerful witness in this community. In Jesus' name I pray. We never do 